Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Conversations with Peter Bogosian. I'm very, very happy to have Michael Lind. Michael is a contributing editor of Tablet and a fellow at New America, a nonpartisan think tank he co-founded. He is the author of numerous books, most recently, The New Class War and How to Pay, How the Suppression of Wages is Destroying America. So Michael wrote a truly good piece. It's, it was one of those pieces I was like, wow, that is really good. Uh, and I, I wanted to talk to him, and he graciously agreed to give me some time. The piece is in Tablet. It's excellent. I would urge you to read it. We'll put a link in the description. But let's jump in. It's the culture of transgression. It's Tablet Mag, T-A-B-L-E-T Mag. You can see it on the screen there. Um, let's jump into what people want to talk about on the Minty Meter. And thanks for, for joining me, Michael. I appreciate your time today. Thank you for having me. Cool. All right. Uh, antinomianism and institutional capture. So be, be, we're going to use those as jumping off points, but tell me about your amazing article in Tablet Mag. Well, I wrote this article called The Culture of Transgression to uh, make a distinction that I think is useful between iconoclasm and uh, antinomianism. Uh, so iconoclasm is associated with uh, new political faiths, with uh, secular creeds like communism or, or the French revolutionary nationalism, where the adherents of these faiths destroy the images and the icons uh, and maybe burn the books of the pre-existing uh, faith or orthodoxy. Uh, and so a lot of what we saw, for example, following the uh, BLM protests with statues being toppled, uh, buildings being renamed and so on. It, it sort of looks like iconoclasm, but I argue it's actually a different kind of ism. It's antinomianism. Uh, so iconoclasm usually is finite in duration. That is, if you're the Protestants in England, once you have smashed all of the stained glass windows in all of the British churches and torn down the statues of the Virgin Mary uh, and whitewashed the interiors of the churches, then you, you stop, right? I mean, it's now a Protestant country. It was a Catholic country. Same was true in the Soviet Union. You got rid of the artworks of the uh, czarist regime, but then you quit tearing everything down and you start building up your own Soviet propagandistic monuments and, and so on. Uh, antinomianism, means just continual transgression, continual destruction that doesn't have a sell-by date. Uh, and you've seen episodes of antinomianism, uh, usually in religious form, with uh, Christianity, Judaism, you know, Islam, other religions, where the antinomians, the, the word antinomian means against law in Greek uh, or against norms. And so the antinomians believe that instead of replacing one set of binding norms with a new set of binding norms, which is usually the goal of iconoclasts, uh, you replace all norms forever. All okay. norms, all laws are bad. Okay, so let's go back, read. Let's put that on the screen again, because that's a great line that Michael wrote there. I'm going to read the whole thing. Put another way, the Western elite culture of transgression is an example of antinomianism, not iconoclas iconoclasm. I iconoclasm. Uh, yeah, a uh, little, little brain fart there. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. The term antinomianism refers to the view that all laws and norms are oppressive always and everywhere, and that the act of transgression itself is virtuous, if not holy. And that's a great idea. So it's a moral thing to go... It, this perpetual revolution, which you write about in the article, the perpetual revolution, the idea that you want to, so is it perpetual destruction of the system? Well, it, it's, it, you destroy the old system, but you prevent a new one from coming forward because to have a new structure is by definition oppressive. So these antinomian episodes, when they occur in history, tends to be in, in cults that burn themselves out, uh, maybe after a few years or a generation or two, uh, because at some point uh, you just can't have endless revolution against the previous revolution. You know, you have to actually 
have some kind of order and hierarchy and stability. So Chaz. it fizzles out. Yes, yeah, no, so that, that's right. That's exactly what happened. It, it reaches a point of no return and then either the country is invaded and conquered because it's been white, destroyed by antinomianism uh, or the people rebel against the antinomian sect. So the antinomians today, who do you, what group or what ideology do you find that embedded in? Well, I, it's really strongest in the identity politics uh, wing of uh, university campuses. And these were women's studies programs, minority studies programs, and so on. They were always very odd addition to the university structure because they were basically created in the 60s and 70s, as you know, uh, to placate radical left-wing activists. And so they, they never made any pretense, as you, you know from your career of, uh, of like being value neutral. You know, they were always uh, uh, engaged in agitation. Now, they were kind of confined to the universities uh, up until really around 2010 or so. That seems to be, according to a lot of measures, when this really escapes. Uh, and it begins reshaping the entire university system. So in the old days, you had, you know, kind of the radical antinomians uh, in the minority studies department claiming everything is white supremacy. But, you know, you could go down the hall to the chemistry department or the economics department or whatever. Uh, that wasn't the case. And then, uh, particularly in the last decade, the chemistry department and the university chancellor, you know, were saying like, everything is white supremacy, right? And, and uh, so that, that's a new development. It kind of broke out of where it had been confined. And the other is uh, through uh, mechanisms like the, the HR departments, this infects these giant corporate bureaucracies where the CEOs themselves are not terribly woke or left wing, but this just gets incorporated. They, they manage to infiltrate and capture uh, the choke points of these institutions. Now, what makes, what adds fuel to the fire, I think, uh, of the capture of the university bureaucracies and the corporate bureaucracies is that the modern university and the modern corporation are inherently anti-traditional. And by that, I mean the modern research university going back to Germany in the late 19th century it's modeled on the natural sciences where you're constantly overthrowing the scientific consensus of last year, right? It's just constant intellectual progress. So the way you become a great scientist is to overthrow what everybody thought before. Uh, okay. You're not pass passing down a tradition. Okay, let me, let me, let me in interrupt and ask you. I know that pe some, some people, a significant minority of people are going to be watching this and they're, they're going to be saying to themselves, this Michael guy he's just some kind of crazy conservative is you don't have to tell me your political position, but is your criticism of this? What is the relationship between your criticism of this and conservatism? If any, <laughs> well, in my career over the last 30 years, I've been kicked out of the conservative movement in the nineties for criticizing Pat Robertson's crackpot conspiracy theories about Freemasons and Jews Behind, being behind wars in the world uh, mm -hmm. and criticizing pseudoscientific racism and libertarianism. Uh, I, I'm now a pariah on the left for criticizing ideas like uh, some men can get pregnant. Uh, so I'm kind of radical. Politically you're, you're radical. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, so I, it's just, yeah, it's just really important to, to make the distinction that if you criticize a bad idea, that doesn't mean that you subscribe to the beliefs of other people who also criticize that idea. You know, if, if I'm against throwing plastic in the ocean and some guy is a race supremacist who's against throwing practice plastic in the ocean, that doesn't mean that I, uh, those, it, that's just a fallacious way to view it. And I think that's what's happening in this space. Now, people from across the political and, even epistemological spectrum, I would even go as far as say metaphysical spectrum, are getting together and criticizing bad ideas. And then the people in defense of those ideas are launching attacks, not 
in terms of an apologia, a defense of the ideas being attacked, but on the people attacking those ideas, smearing them as conservatives and saying, look, he's a conservative, we don't have to listen to anything Michael has to say. Well, well, there are two things going on. One is your enemies lump you together with people that you don't have anything to do with. But there's also a danger for people who realize that a particular element of the establishment is wrong or is lying to then it's kind of human nature. You think, well, these other people say that, that they're also dissidents, maybe they're right, okay? So we know, for example, that the uh, scientific establishment covered up a lot of legitimate uh, uh, thinking about COVID-19 and the lab leak hypothesis and so on. So, but there's a danger that you think, well, Dr. Fauci misled us about COVID. So maybe, you know, there really was a CIA conspiracy to kill JFK and maybe like flying saucers and alien bodies oh, no, really aliens are, are being held. <laughs> oh no, so, aliens. Um, so so it, can, it can work both ways. I mean, you can be lumped together, but also it's dangerous because when you realize that you've been min- misled in some area, it's kind of a slippery slope to lowering your standards towards uh, other kinds of nonsense. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's talk about a few of these things. So if you look at the at the uh, minty meter here on screen, which laws and norms of the West should not be dismantled? And my question to you is, how do we know which laws or set of moral rules ought to be dismantled, and which shouldn't? Clearly, the answer to that question lies between zero and a hundred, right? So the antinomians are at a hundred. And clearly there were bad laws. I mean, miscegenation laws, you could think of many laws on the books. Is there, well, a, I, and I don't, I don't mean to get into meta ethics here, but like, is there a, is there a right answer to that question? I, I think there is. I am deeply influenced by the philosophy of David Hume, yeah. uh, who was an atheist, but he was not a militant atheist. Uh, Hume's argument was, that no one is intelligent enough, not even the greatest philosopher, to tear down all existing structures and then rebuild society on the basis of just you know his own or her own intellect. Uh, and so that being the case with this modesty towards the human intellect, Hume, who again was quite a secular atheist, uh, thought that the best guide to ethics, not to science, that, that's something different, but to ethics, is what he called custom corrected and methodized. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if there's a 2000 year old tradition that says you should have chaperones at teenage parties, uh, you should assume absent evidence to the contrary that there's a reason why there is this tradition, okay? As you will find out if you have a teenage party with no chaperones. Uh, Now it's a rebuttable presumption in favor of this kind of tradition. If you also have a 2000 year old tradition that says women who have black cats uh, are probably witches and they should be hanged or stoned, well, then you can get rid of that tradition. And what's the difference? Uh, In my own view, uh, Peter, is that most of the evil traditions are based on false uh, scientific theories. That is- So you're you're saying that they're factually incorrect. They're factually incorrect. Uh, whereas, so for example, if you're sacrificing people like the Aztecs did every certain number of years because you think the sun will not come up again unless you sacrifice people, that is a factually incorrect view. And you can get rid of it. Okay. All the customs let based me, on it. Let me, let me ask you a question, if I may. If you're uncomfortable with the question, obviously you don't have to answer. Let's say that we lived in a universe that was configured in such a way as when you sacrificed a virgin or doesn't even have to be a virgin when you sacrificed an infant the 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 delta wouldn't flood or the sun would continue to be uh, shed its light on a on a bountiful harvest how could one make the moral decision for whether or not they should sacrifice would it be utilitarian calculus or how how would that be how could one well, go about figuring well, it out well i i can i can give you more radical analogies uh, from uh, biology. So the way that lions reproduce is that a male lion will come in, uh, kill all of the uh, cubs of a female lion, 
And the killing of the cubs excites the lioness. She then goes into estrus and mates with the lion who has just killed all of her cubs uh, and he, uh, bears that lion new children, right? So I do think there is a, I'm, I'm evading your question because we don't live in that universe. In this universe, even with other species, uh, there are species distinct moral systems. So an intelligent lion, this would be the moral honorable thing to do, right? For the mother to mate with the male that had just killed uh, her children. Uh, well, because it's naturalistic, is that, is that the basis? Yes, it's, it's, it's natural for lions. It's evil for human beings. Uh, you know, but they're, they're, they're insects. Yeah, I, think uh, I think it there's a, a, a walking stick or a, a mantis where the female yeah. bite, bites the head bites off of the, the male after of, right? Yeah. So that's, that, just, that would be a ceremony if they were intelligent. Yeah, and Hume also talks about that as an is fallacy. But uh, so is it interesting the use of the word evil? Are you imposing a supernatural metaphysic on that? Like, are you imposing something outside of human reason when you use the word? No, evil? no, no. I think that human beings as social animals and as social primates in particular, uh, the basis of morality is, and this is what Darwin said, you know, in The Descent on Man, it, it's, it's inherited uh, moral sense, Okay. So, for example, in all cultures, regardless of language, uh, there are the same gestures to beg to be spared, right, from the dominant uh, oppressor. You kneel, you weep, uh, and you find this everywhere. It's, it's universal body language, and it is a way of disarming the aggression uh, of human beings in the same way that, for example, wolves and dogs, if they roll around and whimper, that will disarm the aggression of the wolf, the alpha wolf, who's about to kill them otherwise. And the wolf takes pity on them. Uh, and again, this, if you, one of the horrors of modern industrial civilization is that where you see mass murder and mass starvation and things like that, there's no face-to-face -face contact, right? You're bombing mm -hmm. people from the air. Uh, and the, the gas chambers had to be uh, created by the Nazis because so many German soldiers were having nervous breakdowns. Yeah, I read about they, that. They were, yeah, they, yeah. they were ordered to shoot people that they were looking at and could yeah, see yeah. them in the eye. So I, I, my own view is that uh, morality is a natural thing. Uh, but having said that, to go back to my example of the chaperones, now suppose the custom of there being chaperones at uh, teenage parties was justified by, I don't know, Norse mythology, right? It was revealed you know, by the god Odin at some point in the past. Now, if, if you're a secularist, you can say, oh, this is nonsense. Odin doesn't exist. This is just mythology. But it may very well be that the custom is of value, even though the religious uh, mystical rationale is nonsense. Yeah, the custom would be of value if, for example, I'm just riffing off of, of your hypothetical, the custom would be of value if a prior value was in place and that is you didn't want the kids to have sex. Now, that could be because you don't have modern technology like birth control or it could be because you have some kind of Victorian mores or you're what, what they say now is sex negative, but there's a host of values inherent in that that goes around the tradition, right? Yes and no. I, I do think that since uh, human beings evolved over the last modern form, 200,000 years or so, modern Homo sapiens, uh, and we had agriculture for, in, in the old world, not even in the new world, you know, 6,000 years out of 200,000. Uh, and urban oh, Hold on one second. Yeah. One, one second. Hey, Reed, I'm getting a recording error here. Open the recording tab. Is it? That's all right. We're just going to keep going. All right, keep going. I'm just going to talk through it. Sorry, go ahead. So, well, so I, you know, I go on one of the views, not original with me, that we're basically Pleistocene hunter gatherers, and that uh, even if you change the environment and make us peasant farmers or industrial Dilbert office workers in cubicles, uh, you know, there still is this basic uh, set of its physical health as well as mental health that was evolved for this hunter-gatherer setting. And the tragedy of society is that 
uh, and this was true of the agrarian civilization as well as an industrial civilization, uh, the elites structure things uh, for their benefit, not for the benefit of the people they rule. Okay, so so does that not mistake the practical for the good? So, in other words, that's one of William Lane Craig's criticisms of Sam Harris's moral landscape, that, that what you're talking about from an evolutionary perspective has a kind of practicality, whether it be in lions or human communities, but that doesn't mean that there's an ought there. That doesn't mean that there's a should, that there's any kind of moral imperative. Well, I, I say I'm a human. I, I don't agree with the ought is distinction. I think that uh, uh, I, I tend to agree with uh, the late uh, Ed Wilson, E.O. Wilson, yeah. whom I had the, the privilege of knowing that uh, every species has what he called a biogrammar. Right. Uh, and... Uh, you, you want to find out what is ethical for that species, then you investigate like the, the biogrammar. Now, some species like fish, I mean, you know, they don't recognize their own children. They eat them, right, by accident. Uh, but for higher mammals and, and uh, maybe birds and some reptiles, uh, there are moralities, but I think they are species specific. I don't think they're universal. Just a curveball question. If that were the case, could it be said that humans should tamper with their DNA or their wh whatever it is that gave them the morality to alter their new morality. In other words, that would make them gods among themselves. Uh, just a, just a thought. Um, well, if you, if you think uh, as, uh, as Hume did, and as I do, that uh, even the most brilliant Mensa presidents are rather stupid uh, compared to what is possible. Uh, if you had uh, DNA experiments, and, and this will be done somewhere in some society in the future, you're, it's more likely to end up in disaster like thalidomide babies yeah. rather than superhuman yeah, yeah, yeah. gods. So I'm just very skeptical about the ability of, of these non-rational, nepotistic, superstitious primates, which are human beings, to carry out experiments in directed evolution. It's like, yeah, well, maybe. I don't think this species could do it. Yeah. All right, cool. So let me, let me, let me let's get back to your article. So... What's the problem? And I think I went down that road because I was trying to figure out how we would know what systems and rules to overthrow. And the idea seems to be that there should be some if they're if they contain unjustness or, or, or a Rawlsian lens on fairness. And yeah, so here's the thing from the Mintimeter. Which of these should be dismantled? Like, how do we figure that out? Is there a rule? Hate speech laws, faith as an epistemology. DEI, sol solitary confinement. Okay, solitary confinement. <laughs> um, so how do you know what which systems to dismantle? I mean, now you, people want to dismantle the police. They want to abolish prisons. They want to, and please, no one in the comments, don't tell me they don't. Um, so how do you, clearly the answer to that, the, the evolutionary argument is only a broad brush stroke. It's like a blunt instrument to figure that out. How do you drill down on the specificity of, of, of the moral, the, of the, the good? Well, I think here we have to be mindful that these, these institutions that are really central to modern society, like the uh, giant bureaucratic university and the giant bureaucratic corporation, are only 100 or 150 years old. Uh, that is, before that point, people lived in fairly small communities, uh, a lot of face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, and there are real problems, as, as I, I remarked earlier, when you move away from face-to-face -face, uh, communication, which is inherently kind of moderating, uh, you know, to, to these massive bureaucracies. And in particular, I think we have to distinguish areas like, uh, let's say, manufacturing industry, where there are genuine economies of scale. Uh, so the larger the factory, then the uh, cheaper each additional unit of output is, and, and that's valuable. Uh, in when it comes to universities, uh, there, okay. there's that, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, no, you go. I, I interrupted. Sorry. Well, when it comes to universities, I think that. The model of value neutral research and of peer review and all of this, it made sense when it was developed in the 19th century with chemistry and physics uh, and, and some other hard sciences. But on the other hand, I think that we have a lot of things which 
uh, are inherently, there are no economies of scale. For example, let's look at public schools. Uh, I'm not convinced that having a, a public school bureaucracy that supervises millions and millions of students in a consolidated metro area is going to result in better education than a neighborhood school board, for okay. example. So, uh, so bracketing the school, for, for example, if you look at the beginning of your argument about economies of scale, factories, you didn't use the word, but capitalism, the intrinsic goods of capitalism, the intrinsic goods of the engines of knowledge production and the peer review process, isn't the presupposition there that you've started with those values to begin with? Like you've already started from those values and that your conclusion is that you reaffirm the values and the fruits of those values that are reified through them, like institutions, particular factories, et cetera. But isn't the problem with that argument itself that it pulls itself by, up by its own bootstraps through its presuppositions? Well, that's not my presupposition. My, my presupposition is, is kind of communitarian. That is limited factories and in limited knowledge factories in the case of, of universities were created to serve particular communities. All right. Uh, what has happened is uh, as a result of a kind of a bureaucratic Potemkin village uh, yeah. uh, organization, a lot of activities which should never have taken on pseudo industrial form or pseudo scientific form now are done by these big bureaucracies. So let's just look at capitalism, okay? Uh, you know, it makes sense to have giant aerospace corporations. Uh, if you've had to be on the phone recently with uh, any insurance company, uh, there's no economies of scale in terms of insurance. I mean, this is a purely parasitic kind of thing in the United States. Uh, uh, having having okay. a giant insurance company does not result in better insurance than having lots of small town insurance companies. Okay, so I don't think I articulated my question clearly. So the values that you espouse there with capitalism presuppose themselves. Like what, what is your response to somebody who is, who, who is an antinomian who says the whole thing produces disparities in outcome, the whole system is inherently racist and it all needs to be uh, 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 dismantled, disrupted, and abolished. Like, it, is there a way to figure that out? And I'm not buying the evolution. I'll just uh, uh, preempt any evolutionary argument you give me. <laughs> I'm not buying that argument. Uh, is there a way to figure that out? Like, what could we appeal to? It, it, it... No, I, I think there it's simply uh, skepticism about the limits of human intellect, okay? So if someone comes and says, well, we don't need piecemeal reform of particular bads in particular social evils and in institutions. We need to burn the whole thing down and rebuild yeah. a new one. But exactly. then it's just, I, I don't believe you. It's like, well, first of all, how do you know that everything is bad? And also before we burn everything down, I wanna see your plan, okay? I mean, you can't be like Karl Marx and say, we're gonna have a revolution, but we're not gonna tell you like what kind of- okay insurance sure. there is after the revolution all right so let me let me let me respond to that in a way that i think that the detractors of modernity would res respond to that those truly ensconced in applied postmodernism because the system produces disparities in outcome we know that it's inherently unfair and thus we know that it has to be dismantled so before we go on to other things what would your response to that be and so, so they're antinomian in, in the extreme. We know that it has to be dismantled. Well, what they're doing there is the uh, error that uh, Hume talked about, where uh, it, it's a, basically a pathology of philosophy, where you take one value, in this case, fairness, uh, right. and then you try to judge an entire society by it, which is an intellectual mistake, okay? Uh, well, what other, what is, value should it be judged by if not fairness? It's not judged. You do not judge societies as a whole, right? See, this is a modern conception. And it's got some roots in the Western tradition because you did have Plato and various uh, uh, Renaissance uh, philosophers coming up with utopias and so on. But from, from this kind of, you know, vulgar bastard humanism, and I'm, I'm not a philosopher myself, it's just how I work things out. 
uh, it's the wrong question to ask to say what is the ideal society and then What's compare the right, compare, question? the right question is what hurts right now okay so there's a rebuttable presumption in favor of things as they are, they are but if your next generation stops having families and kids and people are unhappy with their jobs uh, and you know patriotism is collapsing and things like that then you can say well this is not healthy and we don't it's just like if you're a patient you know that your knee hurts right or if you have terrible migraines you don't have to have a theory of it you can ju okay. just say it hurts and then you go to the doctor and the doctor doesn't say okay well we're basically going to uh deal with every single organ simultaneously you you have selective limited treatments of the particular okay. areas so what is your response to those people those antinomians who say listen the system needs to be dismantled just the whole thing is corrupt endemic corruption disparities of outcome etc misogyny bigotry homophobia racism and all the other transphobia uh, ableism uh, heteronormativity etc and we don't need to present any alternative to that we know that the system is not working Maybe they'll say the most vulnerable. We maybe they won't say the most vulnerable. What 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 is your response to the idea that that see this is just just incidentally this is the good thing about not having to defend your ideas because you don't believe in speech and discourse is because you never have to answer hard questions when people ask them of you. But but it just is it's a way to be intellectually lazy and hide under the banner of virtue and then get virtue points from other people who happen to hold these delusions but so what what is the response to that then what is your response that we don't need we don't need to offer an alternative we just know that the system is broken and needs to be d destroyed well i'll tell you my response but first i have to tell you that i had this very conversation oh, some okay, years great. ago with, with with someone who said he was a critical theorist okay yes yes so i said well, well what do you criticize and he said total straight face he said we criticize everything. So then I ask, well, from, from what standpoint do you criticize everything? From what perspective, right? Because you must have a oppression. Of, of, yeah. No, he just said, no, no, it's just we don't have a standpoint. We criticize everything. Lived so at that, then. Yeah. at that point, he, my response, yeah. right. you know, I think the appropriate response is there's a famous line from the uh, early 20th century Ring Lardner in a short story. And the line is this, shut up, he explained. Just shut up. So do you, <laughs> There's, do it's, you it's, believe... it's not a conversation. You cannot converse with people like this. So you believe that those people are, are impervious to reason? They are metaphysically mad, to use uh, Edmund Burke's term. They, they may be perfectly able to function in life and to like wheel and deal and academic bureaucracies or whatever, or, you know, make journalism. coffee in the morning. Yeah. I think make coffee. They'd be happy, you know, family members, but they are insane. I mean, they, they are, are metaphysically insane. They are living in a, in an incoherent mental universe. Yeah. I guess that's where, that's a, a, a point of disagreement I have. I, I believe everybody has the hope to live a life of reason and become sane and, or vir virtually everybody, not somebody who's clinically insane or suffering from you know head trauma or something. But uh, and, and I've had conversations with I don't even know how many of those people, prison inmates, just people who who have been completely down on their luck. Um, all right, so so let me sorry that my neighbor's dogs are over here. They love coming over here because I give them so much loving. Okay, so uh, so so aside from saying anything to an indiv one particular individual who happens to harbor this delusion what would you say to an antinomian in general for why as crazy as this is a, is, is a question is going to be michael why we shouldn't destroy the entire civilization and have a perpetual revolution like what what is the argument against that as crazy as a question as that is I don't think you argue with these people. I mean, you just, you disempower them. You prevent them. Uh, you that's, do not that's argue. What they want to do is, 
that's what they want to do is postmodernism when they view everything through the lens of power. That's a very Foucauldian notion. Yeah, but this is where I guess I am a small c conservative. I think it is totally different for an existing community to prevent somebody who said, oh, I just wrote this book and I created my own secular religion and I'm going to reconstruct society in, uh, from top to bottom. And, you know, basically to ignore that person or ostracize them, cancel them as it were, I think that's appropriate. Uh, uh, I don't think they're on the same, you don't have to debate them, right? Now, if someone comes along and says, slavery and communism are evils, and we know it because the slaves in the South are running away to free states in the North. They're voting with their feet. And we know it because people are risking getting shot by uh, going over the wall in East Berlin to be free. And people are not moving in the other direction. Then you can say, okay, well, this is a sign. You don't have to have a theory of the world. But basically, well, you, people, could, you know, it, the, yeah. the, these, are, these are specific evils that we can get the, rid of without the, getting rid of grocery stores and insurance, for example. The, the, the response to that is they're brainwashed and they're mistaken, right? They're just mistaken when they try to go over the wall. They well, really don't is, understand the joys, the, 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 the moral obligation, the evolutionary imperative of flattening the economic hierarchy. And so that's just their greed speaking that they need to overcome. Well, this is another reason I think that certain amounts of, of kinds of dialogues with certain people with certain mentalities are a waste of time. Uh, and you see this in pseudosciences like Freudianism and Marxism, where uh, they cannot be falsified, right? Because if you disagree with them, that is proof that you are neurotic, according to the Freudians, or that you are bourgeois, or that you suffer from false consciousness. If you're a Marxist, yeah, so, so that the moment you realize you're talking to somebody whose ideology, and it's true of religion too, right? You're the, uh, you've been seduced by Satan, maybe. The moment you realize that uh, anything you say can be explained away by this kind of ad hominem attack, then to me, the conversation is over. You just uh, don't talk to them. You, you form a coalition to make sure See, that to me stay is out of power. That to me is where the conversations get going. That to me is when, <laughs> when, the, good, when the good stuff happens right there. Well, um, you're 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 a you're a good you're a good academic. You're a better professor than I was. So. No, I I <laughs> am not an academic in that sense at all. In fact, the traditional academic, uh, well, I shouldn't say the, the the contemporary academic would have none of it. That's why the Socratic method has fallen out of favor. In fact, not only out of favor is, is it's viewed as whatever the akin to the devil would be, you know, to question, to question these students shouldn't question these beliefs, you know, you don't, you know, but that's, that's the story for another day. And I don't think there's anything to do with being a good academic. I think that ha that has to do with the fundamental core enlightenment value and belief in the uh, idea that reason can emancipate people and that you can, that you can use the dialectic to elicit that in people that's just a, a core belief. We could talk about that or we can go back. I'd like to actually go back to your article because I, I love it so much. Um, okay, so what do you want people to take away from that, that fantastic article on Tablet Mag? Well, I, I think to understand, first of all, this distinction between iconoclasm and, and uh, uh, antinomianism. So if this were just iconoclasm, then as soon as the woke or whoever you want to call this group wins, then they will stop being iconoclastic. They'll tear down the old statues, but they'll put up their new statues. They'll have their new classics. They'll have their new canons, their new orthodoxies. I, I don't see that happening because I think that in this kind of antinomian culture, uh, the next generation will then have to tear down whatever the previous generation of antinomians did. So essentially, uh, antinomianism, as I said before, when it's erupted, you know, in pre-modern times, uh, it's usually crushed by an invasion from outside the country or the city, right? They just so like that would go to show you yeah. that would go to show you that that if you lived in liberal Western democratic societies, this is going to sound. Mm, I want to make sure this comes out right, but I but I won't. I'll just throw it out there. They brought it on themselves. Well, this is why I, I mean, raised the the, the the bureaucratization of the university and of the uh, 
uh, of the corporation because originally in the 19th century, the universities, they, they were very controlled by the community, right? To an extent that many intellectuals found yeah. oppressive. Weber talks oppressive. about that. Yeah. yeah, so so the purpose of the Ivy League was to turn out like young upper class wasp Christian men of good character who were clubbable. And if they picked up a little chemistry or astronomy on the way or Latin or Greek, that's okay, but, but that's not the main mission, right? Uh, and the mission of the corporation was to build up American industry to compete with that of Britain, you know, the, the superior uh, industrial power. And these were just the communal goals of the corporation so, and of the university. Now, once those goals were abandoned, and I'm not defending those particular goals, yeah. then, you, then you have these enormously powerful academic bureaucracies that say, the, the academy says we're value neutral, we're totally open, we have no standpoint of our own. And you have the, the corporation saying, uh, we don't have any social responsibility. We just you know, want to make money and please consumers and, and be progressive. At that point, these powerful bureaucracies become subject to infiltration and capture by highly disciplined ideological groups. And they have no immune system against that. Yeah, they have no immune system. So, so breaking from that analogy and giving another one, do you think this is uh, related or parallel. Do you think that the Achilles heel of Western liberalism, and you see this in what Rumsfeld termed old Europe, do you think that it's that they, and I'm going to relate this back to the article, your article in a minute in Tablet Mag, do you think that it's that they can't deal with fundamentalist intolerance like religious islamic fundamentalists and they can't deal with the idea of closed borders they can't deal with there are some fundamental flaws within the ideology itself that lead to its own demise yeah uh, robert frost had a, a joke uh, frost was quite right wing he said a liberal is someone who never takes his own side in an argument right, right. <laughs> so uh, so you you have this culture of modern technocratic value neutral liberalism where they they can't they have no bouncers they can't keep anybody out of the club uh, and they're vulnerable to being uh, taken over in their own clubs by Correct. radicals of various kinds and it's from the right as well as the left so for example in the 1990s as you may recall uh, when creation science was a big thing this this was uh, anti darwinian uh, Protestant fundamentalism, uh, pushing, you know, this pseudoscience that the earth is 6,000 years old and biblical literalism. You had this phenomenon in school boards around the country where groups of creationists would run for the school board, right. but they would, they would not run on creation. They would run on like property taxes or something. And right. once they had a critical mass, then they dropped the mask, right? And they banned Darwin you know, Darwinian evolutionary biology from the schools. So it's extremist sects of all kinds, left, right, and center, I think uh, are naturally attracted to these large bureaucratic organizations because let's face it, they probably can't get elected appealing to voters, but if you can sink your alien, you know, brain worm into the spinal cord of corporations, or of university bureaucracies, then suddenly you, you've acquired great power. With that. I know it sounds sort of conspiratorial, but it's just no, a no description. It, it, yeah. it doesn't. It doesn't. I've been talking a lot about Popper's 1945 paradox of tolerance. It doesn't. I had a, a good buddy of mine years ago who told me that we're not suited to handle other people's crazies. For example, from immigration, or we're not suited to even handle. Uh, um, certain types of our own crazies. So what we need to do is cultivate certain crazies that enable them, it's kind of, kind of like, a, I was going to make a Star Trek reference, but people tell me not to. Uh, are you a Star Trek fan? The old series, not so much the newer ones. Good, I good. Then, you, then you're not dead. Then you're not dead to me. But uh, <laughs> Section 31, you know, it's like you have to cultivate, you have to have someone to do the dirty work of the foundation. Like you have to have right. somebody to do the the 
somebody who has a spine who can push back on the illiberalism to enable liberalism to, to thrive. So I want to relate that to your article. And or actually, let me ask you, how do you think that relates to antinomianism? Well, I think what we're seeing is uh, basically all of this is undemocratic, right? Because you have these massive concentrations of power, which for very good reasons in the case of the university and of the corporation uh, were acquired some distance from popular democracy and pop mob prejudice and passion and so on. So they could do their jobs, you know, of, of academic research and of, uh, uh, you know, doing innovative corporate things that might upset existing uh, ways of doing things. Uh, but the problem is, I, I think we're, we're seeing a point now where if it becomes impossible to dig these sects out of the spinal cord by surgery uh, of these institutions yeah. they've controlled, then you do see things, for example, and I'm not defending DeSantis necessarily. I think there's some good and bad things he's done. But what you see in Texas with the Texas uh, legislature cracking down on DEI and universities, you're going to see the community through democratic politics reassert itself uh, mm, and say not, that these, these institutions. Sure that's true. Yeah. I, you know, I, the, so, only reason, the only reason I say it, I'm not sure that's true is because they have jobs for life. Well, I would get rid of tenure, but but that's a I would uh, too. A, you know, a different uh, subject. I, compl I um, completely agree. I don't. So I don't know how those democratic reforms are going to take place. Again, piggybacking off DeSantis, as long as you have DEI boards and you still have organizational capture. Well, I think you have to distinguish between the tenured professors who are a dying breed. Only a minority of uh, academics now are actually tenured professors. Most of them are non-tenured professors, something that I was for, for, for five years and uh, at the University of Texas and earlier uh, for a year at Harvard and uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, I think that's a good system. You basically have, uh, you know, multi-year contracts, right? So that you're not immediately looking for your next job, but they, they should be three to five year contracts. Oh. I was going to say, what's the that in that sense? You said, I think that's a good system. What, the multi-year contracts? Yeah, it's preferable than having this highly, you know, banana republic inequality between a few tenured professors who stop doing anything or writing or thinking yeah. the moment they get tenure. And then having, worse. Then yeah. having all these I, freeway I flyers who are paid 16000 a year to teach seven courses, which is just exploitation. Yeah, when I was an adjunct, I made a lot less, but that was a lot, long time ago. Even the, the, the other problem is that you, you have to be a good boy or a good girl and when you have tenure and keep your mouth shut to get tenure and keep your mouth shut. And that process cultivates a kind of sedition and a kind of uh, adherence to you don't want to rock the boat, you don't want to cause trouble. And if you do that long enough, it's not as if, oh, you get tenure because then you go for full professor. So I think that there's something rotten in the system that more people aren't speaking openly and honestly about. And the irony there is it was meant to do exactly the opposite, right? To allow people to to speak freely, particularly in their own areas of, of expertise. Well, well remember, there have been two models of, of higher education in the US. The original model which goes back to Britain and then before that to the uh, Renaissance Italian academies. Mm, mm, this was, mm. it was essentially a prep school for upper class men, you know, uh, uh, and then yeah, maybe at Vassar, you had their, their future brides. Uh, and there was no intellectual freedom there. I mean, it was simply a, a kind of like a debutante, you know, uh, preparatory school. Uh, the model that we have now, the German research university, it's actually very fascinating and admirable. Uh, the German ideal, was Lehrenheit and Lehrenfreiheit. It was freedom of teaching and freedom of speech. Uh, and this originated in the 19th century because the physical scientists, for the most part, wanted uh, not to be interfered with by the state church, right? And what you get is this interesting custom where the, the administration of the original German research university, it had to be professors. It was not full-time bureaucrats. Because if you were in Prussia or in Bavaria, you did not want Prussian bureaucrats and Bavarian bureaucrats running your university. You wanted them as far away from the university as possible. That's that very interesting. 
Yeah, that's, yeah, the, that's the custom where the professors would do the administrative work. It would not be outside bureaucrats. So the University of Austin, of which I'm a founding faculty fellow, it has a fascinating model. And I'm, I'm not positive that this is exactly the case, but I think that this is what's going to happen, is that the, the bureaucracy, which will be minimal and there will be no DEI, will not be housed on campus. And I find that to be fascinating. I will think they be in prison? Will, will, will they be in jail? <laughs> I, I, well, there'll be no DEI board, and I think it will be outsourced. And so on yeah. the campus, there's an immediacy and a, a direct experience that's not mediated through any third party or external body. It's just well, I, no, I, 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 I wish them luck. But so here's the problem with all bureaucratic organizations. And I discovered this. I work in the NGO world, the academy, you know, the, the uh, uh, journalism sector, you name it, uh, government. So in America, in the 21st century, the way you ask for a raise is to say you are supervising other people, okay? So, and let's say, I won't say the University of Austin, but they bring in a communications director. So six months later, the communications director says, oh, we can do so much more, but I will need two assistants, okay? So then now there are three communications people. There's the, the boss and the two assistants. So then uh, a year later, oh, this is going so great, but we're really stretched thin. Our assistants need assistance, okay? And this is, I think, this wasn't this Parkinson's law that this is how these bureaucracies grow. It's so by multiplying the people un, 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 underneath of them. Uh, I think it's British uh, sociologists who studied bureaucracy. Uh, so... This is the thing you've got to watch out for. And this is what I was talking about earlier with diseconomies of scale, because the premise is right. that, that having a larger group with more specialized uh, functionaries will be more efficient than just having a flat, simple hierarchy with generalists. Uh, here is Reed's. Thanks, Reed. Uh, Parkinson's law is the observation that the duration of a public administration bureaucracy or official to expands to fill its allotted time span, regardless of the amount of work to be done. This is attributed <laughs> mainly to two factors. The officials want subordinates, not rivals, and the officials make work for each other. All right, cool. Uh, I have a few kind of a random questions to end here. Uh, and so my first question is, let's say that that 10% of the books that you've read in your life, that memory would be randomly, or the random 10% of books would be completely erased from your brain. And in exchange for that, you'd get five IQ points. Would you do it? Well, I don't read books cover to cover since most of them are so badly written. So probably, yeah. <laughs> Uh, would you, you would you barter would you barter five percent of your academic would you barter ten percent of your historical and academic knowledge for five IQ points? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, because uh, basically your your memory and and to some the extent I've had academic and journalistic success, I, I have kind of a semi photographic memory. I'm not bragging about it, but you have to have the material for your mind to work on. But the more powerful your mind. Yeah. My, then the, my, uh, my the less writing, important the material partner does too. Yeah. Yeah. James Lindsay does too. Um, what, what quality, what quality for you is more important than intelligence? Wisdom. It's wisdom. What do you mean and, by that? Yeah. What do you mean by it, that? Well, there's a, a wonderful German word. I'm sorry to keep quoting German, but they have these words we don't have. Sorry. It's called Menschenkinder, knower of human beings. Uh, so you have to be able to understand how ordinary people think and feel, and this is acquired through experience and through empathy. Uh, it's not something you get simply, if, if you were completely isolated and you never dealt with human beings, but you had the world's greatest library uh, and you had universal access you know, to all this information, uh, you just wouldn't get certain things that you acquire you know, from being drunk and in love and partying with people and so on. And so there's, there's, and people with, with intelligence, but without wisdom are dangerous. I mean, they're almost like sociopaths where you lack normal human feelings. 
but you have a first rate intelligence. What do you look for? Like what quality in friendships, which of those would be more important to you, intelligence or wisdom? Oh, Emerson, oh wi wisdom, of course. Uh, Emerson has a great, uh, and, and also like common sense. Uh, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote <laughs> that in, in, in choosing a friend, you yeah. should want someone that you would travel across the continent of North America in, in a covered wagon, right? Oh, so when it breaks I, down I that. Uh, in, in the middle of the Great Plains, you know, this is a useful companion. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Do, do you think the same, the same doesn't apply for romantic companions, does it? Well, uh, it depends on whether it's a short term or long term. Uh, yeah. The long term, it would be close to the Emersonian, I think. Uh, huh. You know, the weekend, I don't know. Huh. I'm going to ask you, if this is too personal of a question, you don't have to answer it. Would you give up five IQ points if you could throw away your glasses forever? No. Why would I? Uh, uh, the great thing about uh, modern technology is, and this is why I'm against genetic engineering, we oh, don't have tell to. Me. I'm, I'm dying to know. We don't have to modify our bodies and our brains. We we have technology that we modify the natural universe around us, right? Uh, and so this is, uh, you know, we don't have to grow gills. We have, you know, scuba gear. We don't have to grow wings. We we have airplanes. And so uh, the the great thing is like so I'm nearsighted, asthmatic. You know, uh, I would not have survived you know, 100 or 200 years ago from infancy. Uh, but thanks to modern technological civilization, you can have uh, unfit people like me, you know, can flourish. Uh, so more power to technology. I'm, I'm for, I'm for uh, technology that augments Ice Age human beings. I'm against biotechnology that alters Ice Age human beings. I think that would probably backfire. All right, real quick, I, last question I have for you, and I got a bad back. I pulled it today, and that's why I'm been rubbing it. So if, if it looks like I'm doing anything creepy, it's not unless I hurt my back. Um, so before we do the super chats, two questions. How worried about you? How worried are you about AI in terms of a? Well, how worried about you are you about AI? Not at all. Not at all. Uh, because I think that. Uh, Anything that machines can do, including thinking machines, that uh, they can do better than humans, liberates humans to do human work. And a lot of human work is care work. You know, it's, it's uh, personal intimacy and, and taking care of people. Uh, so that if a machine can grade mathematics exams, then, then more power to it. Uh, and, uh, and again, I've, I've been quoting Hume all through this uh, hour just because he's influenced me. Uh, yeah. The reason I don't worry about the machines taking over uh, is because unlike animals, unlike us, uh, they don't have these these motives, right? So, so Hume's argument was that reason is and should be the slave of the passions. Right. So if you have re reason by itself, it's like a car sitting there with a key in it, but the car has nowhere to go. You have to have a human being who wants to go somewhere. Right. Now, AI would be very scary if it had emotions like people uh, and lust and desire and ambition and all of that. But, but I don't think this is a problem for our generation. Interesting. All right. Uh, I think Michael Shermer, my friend Michael Shermer shares that view. By the way, just as an aside, I am, this is, this is true. I'm not joking when I tell you this. I am very good friends. One of my best friends is a direct descendant of David Hume's brother. All right. We have two super. That's true. It's true. We have uh, two super chats. Uh, loved your interview with the Indian Jesus. Thank you. I recognize him as the one true Indian Jesus. That's melted my media. What else do we have? We have another one to read. Uh, for a guy, the foot fetishist from 4chan. There you go. Five bucks. Any thoughts on Leah Remini's lawsuits against Scientology? Perhaps you would have her as a guest in the future. Are you familiar with that, Michael? No, I'm not. I think she's. I, I think she's great. I, I'd love to have her as a guest. I think this, she's great. Then, uh, unlike some people I know, I try to limit the number of people who despise me. I try to limit the number of people who consider me their enemies. Uh, uh, my writing. I, I don't. I don't. I don't. Does not. I. I <laughs> yeah, well, in, in Washington, I lived in Washington for many years. I don't know anything about 
Scientology, but for a while they were picketed by by protesters dressed as penguins and, and oh, wearing wearing the fifth of no big the guy fox masks so oh, so yeah, it's definitely yeah, yeah, an interesting yeah. subject <laughs> yeah yeah that's interesting so miss cabbage david the, the the head of ceo the, the, the head of ceo and interesting business you know, it's recognized as a religion and and uh it's an interesting thing and in, stuff in german law and they're very 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 litigious so I had a, a I had a guest lecture of mine, and I was asking him one one time in my my atheism class about that. And he's like, I'm not going to criticize Scientology because uh, I just I just don't want to get sued. And I thought it was interesting that he even went after another religion that I want. Well, name, well, maybe I, I've I've got so many critics. Maybe I should incorporate as a religion. What do you think? Yeah, they, there you go. Uh, and I, at that point, I had enough people telling me, you know, use the phrase earlier militant atheist. I've kind of worried, wondered what that was. I had enough people telling me that I was I was a religious atheist. I thought, you know, why not start why not start my own church <laughs> and I can use the words of people who get, view me as their enemy some, to say, listen, I really am. <laughs> get get uh, some tax benefits. All right, we got another super chat. Who we got here? Read Parahesia. Oh, I love that name. Uh, biotechnology like uh, CRISPR and embryo screening are going to improve the welfare by extending lives to disease reduction more so than environmental intervention. Opposition means more suffering. So, do you follow? Have you been following it at all? I've well, I, I'm not. I'm not completely. I'm not completely opposed to germline engineering. That is, if you can identify. So, for example, I have terrible asthma. I mean, if you can identify, you know, an asthma gene, get rid of it, okay. But what yeah. happens if you got rid of the asthma gene and it destroyed Marcel Proust's creativity, right? If it's linked to other things, that's the concern about not understanding all of the. What if it turns out that, you know, intellectual genius is related to manic depressive genes, for example? Uh, and if or you violence, get rid of one, or violence. Or violence. Or yeah. I've yeah. yeah, yeah. I've often just tampering with that makes me so fundamentally uncomfortable. I'm far more. I'm going to say this, and there's be like five thousand comments on this, but it's true. I'm far more comfortable with solutions to geoengineer the planet, like you know, heat shields between the sun and the earth, than I am with talked about um, uh, bioengineering. All right, but well, we got to wrap it up. Cool. I'd like to thank Michael Lind, and once again recommend his unbelievably good essay on tablet and you can where where can people find you or can they find you well i i write for i'm not on social media i write for curated publications uh, uh my main home is tablet i also write for a compact magazine and, and in britain unheard and sometimes well, uh, unheard is States great Love and the unheard. new statesman as well yeah, yeah. New state students is great. All right, Michael, don't hang up, stay on, and thanks everybody for listening. We appreciate it. We appreciate the super chats and your support. Read Michael's article, it's fantastic. Thanks everybody, and I'll I'll see you soon. Thanks.